because right now I'd like to introduce Dr. Alexander Harrow. I don't see him. He's from the USGS Movements and Passage of the American Eel and Lamprey. Great, thank you, Virginia. Yeah, um, there you are. Yeah, I think I've shared <laughs> everything except my screen yet. So uh, <laughs> hopefully you can hear me. Um, yeah. Can I share my screen now? Okay. Um, Perfect. More click I'm here. interested in this. I need to get some more. All right. So I want to just uh, thank the Friends Group uh, and uh, Virginia, Jason, and uh, Melissa for inviting me to, to come and talk to you briefly today. Um, I'm a little bit familiar with uh, the Lake Warner and Mill River system, uh, but perhaps not as much as I should be. Um, my name is Alex Harrow. I work with the U.S. Geological Survey at the Conte Nedros Fish Lab up in Turner's Falls. And I've been doing work on fish passage for about 30 years or so with uh, uh, with this group here. So um, a number of years ago, though, I remember meeting with uh, with Jason and uh, Caleb Slater talk about potential for fish passage, primarily passage for eels at the dam at Lake Warner. And um, nothing was really done at that point, um, but the potential still is there. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit today about um, what sorts of things might be doable. Um, and uh, uh, entertain any questions. I will talk a little bit about the life history of these two species, though, because um, they are sort of the forgotten fish of our watershed. And yet for Lake Warner system and, and Mill River, they're probably um, the two that have the greatest potential, at least for, for restoration in the watershed. So I'll start talking about eels. Uh, eels are what are called catadromous. Um, they spawn out in the open ocean in the Sargasso Sea but live uh, and feed and grow mostly in, in freshwater uh, systems. Um, they're generalist species. Uh, they, they occur in many types of habitats, lakes, streams, uh, what have you, and they feed on, on a very wide variety of prey items, mostly aquatic um, macroinvertebrates, but uh, some other things as well. They're very long lived um, and they grow slowly. Um, and when they reach adult size uh, in, the, in fresh water, they can be you know, anywhere from five to 25 years old and some even older and range in size anywhere from about um, 18 inches up to uh, over three feet long. And I'm sure you've heard tales of, of very large eels. Uh, they're actually quite common here in the upper uh, uh, Connecticut River Basin. Uh, and these are just a few short photos to kind of show you their size range um, down here we have the elver, which is the very smallest size that's come in, right, come in right from the, from the ocean about a year after they're spawned in the Sargasso, they, they arrive in this small form and then grow very slowly over the, over the next five to, to 25 years. Um, they were fairly ubiquitous uh, throughout the Eastern US, uh, at least historically. Um, they ranged all the way inland to some of the Midwestern states uh, into New Mexico, believe it or not. And from as far north as uh, uh, Greenland and as far south as northern South America. So um, they're quite, uh, quite broad ranging. As I said, they occupy a variety of habitats so they can exploit all that, all that range. Um, their abundance uh, is um, uh, at, a, at a historic low right now. And according to the best things that, that we know of, the, the uh, uh, pre-colonial uh, estimates of population size may have been one to two orders magnitude higher than it is now. So there were a lot of eels around uh, back before when people started building dams, which is uh, pretty much what's uh, reduced their range. Right now, it's about 20% of what the historic range is and mostly confined uh, to these coastal habitats, uh, you know, 10 to 20 miles inland. Much more than 20, 30 miles inland, you don't encounter eels in, in uh, 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 very high densities. Um, their life history is, is known to us now. It was a great mystery for a long time. Uh, as I said before, the, the eels spawn in the Sargasso and lay their eggs. Um, and then um, the juvenile eels, the little white larvae here called leptocephali, drift north with the Gulf Stream for about a year. They enter fresh water and then feed and grow and then migrate as adults um, these large, you know, three feet long, three foot long eels migrate downstream in the fall 
into coastal waters and then somehow get back to the Sargasso uh, and spawn within about a year or so. Uh, we don't know much about that phase of the life history, but it's very, very interesting um, as, as far as a fish life history goes. Um, what they do in freshwater, though, um, is also quite interesting. I mentioned they come in as this elver or glass eel phase here uh, into the coastal waters, and they can do a lot of things. They can contribute to, to swim upstream for year after year. And in the Connecticut River, the farthest north uh, eels have been documented, I think, is the third Connecticut lake. So they can go a long ways, um, again, because they're, they're so uh, long lived. Or they can sort of just go back and forth between um, uh, fresh water and an estuary. We see this a lot on an annual basis. Um, fish uh, eels will, will do this sort of annual movement. And some actually just stay right in coastal habitat. They never enter fresh water at all. But we think it's probably a, a, not the majority of, of eels that do that. Most of them do enter fresh water at some at some phase. Recently, there's been economic interest in glass eels um, because they can be captured in large numbers and exported, um, and mostly export, exported to Asia where they're grown out uh, in, um, in aquaculture situations uh, for consumption, mostly in Asia. Um, and this was a multi-million dollar fishery in the 1990s to 2000s. If you caught a pound of of glass eels, it could be worth upwards of several thousand dollars uh, to an Asian buyer. Since then, uh, there's been re regulation to limit the catch more now. Uh, so there's very strict control over, over glass eel uh, collection and, and export. Uh, so we've got that under control. Um, you'll occasionally see eels in the market. Um, I stopped by Stop and Shop uh, a few years ago and noticed they were selling eels. It was not a big seller, especially at eleven dollars a pound. Um, but um, it's uh, it's there uh, if you know where to look for it. Um, it. Usually, it shows up uh, in the in the sushi market uh, or as an unagi, which is sort of a barbecued eel that you'll find in in a lot of uh, Asian restaurants. Um, but it's not a big seller like salmon or or cod or something like that. Um, I want to segue now about passage. Um, I mentioned that they get into fresh water and they start migrating upstream. Um, and most eels will try to get as far upstream as they possibly can. When they encounter a dam though, that's a problem. Um, as it is a problem for most fish because most fish can't jump over a dam if it's, if it's very high. Um, eels, <clears throat> being eels though, have a few tricks up their sleeves and they can ascend uh, uh, by either crawling up the wetted surfaces or finding cracks in the dams, um, or just waiting until the dam gets submerged at a high flow and just swim over it at, at that point. But we found that usually the efficiency of, of eels getting over a dam without any kind of fish passes is usually very low. Uh, less than 1% of the fish actually, actually are successful. Um, this is a short video, and I'm hoping that, that this will run, of, of a small elver, maybe about three inches long, uh, climbing up a, uh, a vertical concrete wall. This concrete wall is wet, it's going straight up, and it can stick onto the wall just by surface tension and enough roughness, and it will stay on and work its way up right over a vertical dam face. Uh, but it has problems. If it gets into the high flow too much, uh, it gets swept down. So it's a long, arduous climb, and they get picked off by predators uh, pretty easily. And then the other risk to them is when they, when they do mature uh, and become adults, then they have to swim downstream back to the ocean. And if they've gotten past the dam, if that's a hydro dam, um, they can be killed going through the turbines. Um, or if they go over a spillway that has a, a pretty high uh, uh, fall, then um, they, can be, they can be injured that way. Uh, so it's, it's a tough journey for them, uh, given all the barriers that we've put in, in place for them. I'm gonna jump over and talk about sea lamprey. Um, again, it's an another long skinny fish species, uh, but very abundant here uh, in the lower Connecticut River. It's what we call a nadromous, um, and it has the reverse life cycle of, uh, of eels. It basically spawns in fresh water, and then the young go out to the ocean to feed and grow. Um, the adults are parasitic on other fish. That is, they latch onto other fish and, and, and uh, digest their tissues that way. Uh, but the larvae, when they're in freshwater, are actually filter feeders. They filter out um, mostly detritus, 
uh, and, and gave their nutrition that way. Um, they're very important ecologically to freshwater systems. Um, a lot of people ask me, well, what good are lamprey? Well, when the adults spawn, they die and they die in fresh water and all the nutrients in their bodies basically get recycled back into the freshwater ecosystem. Uh, so it becomes a very significant source of nutrients for things like uh, aquatic invertebrates um, uh, uh, and, and other species that uh, will take advantage of those kinds of nutrients that normally they couldn't get otherwise. The sea lamprey, though, is an invasive species now in the Great Lakes. It's gotten into the Great Lakes through the Welland Canal, um, and it's a very serious problem there because they have no natural predators in the Great Lakes. The adults don't go to, back down to the ocean. They go to the Great Lakes and feed on things like lake trout, whitefish, and so on, uh, and then spawn in the tributaries off the, off the Great Lakes. So um, for us here, we like lamprey. For those in the Great Lakes, uh, they're a real problem. Uh, so there's many control pro programs uh, for, for lamprey uh, out there. This is their historic range. Again, uh, the orange is, is our native species here along the coast. Um, they don't go very far inland, uh, but uh, if there's habitat, they'll, they'll find it. And then the purple is where they've invaded uh, into the Great Lakes. And they're in all the Great Lakes now. So it's a serious problem, both for the U.S. Um, and Canada. Again, here's the life cycle. Um, the, uh, the, the, spawn, the adults come into fresh water and they spawn. Uh, if you're lucky, you get to see them because they spawn in shallow water and they make actually nests out of rock. The adults spawn and then die. And then the larvae grow uh, in, the, in the sediment in the bottom for anywhere from three to 15 years. Again, they're slow growing, uh, but they get up to a certain size, about six inches long, and they transform into the parasitic phase. And at that point, um, go back out uh, into the ocean um, or in the case of the Great Lakes or one of the Great Lakes and begin uh, feeding on adults uh, or adu other fishes at that point. Um, so in an, an, again, another real interesting life cycle. So what are our options for lamprey and eel passage uh, for the Lake Warner and, and Mill River? Well, uh, there's a lot of habitat for both species in the watershed. I think it was mentioned earlier today that there's about 30 square miles of watershed. Um, that's a big watershed. Um, and certainly um, a lot of riverine habitat and lake habitat, uh, especially for eels. Uh, lake Warner is probably prime habitat for, for eels. Uh, but the riverine habitat uh, is, is probably adequate for, for lamprey. Um, there are benefits to, um, the, to the lake and stream ecosystems. I, I talked about the nutrients that the adult lamprey bring in. And um, in some cases, adult eels uh, can be top predators, um, so they have significant control uh, over uh, some of the other species and aquatic invertebrates uh, in, in stream ecosystems. Um, question for the, for the watershed, though, we know about the mill uh, or the Lake Warner Dam being a problem for passage, but are there other barriers upstream? And I don't really know. Uh, perhaps folks in the, in the friends group do know. And whenever you talk about providing passage at one dam, um, there, there is a need for uh, considering all the dams in the, in the system. So there may be another dam farther up that uh, could present another problem that needs to be addressed. So for eels, uh, upstream passage is actually relatively easy to implement. We'll get to that in, in a second. But we also have to think about, uh, do we have adequate downstream passage for the adults? Fortunately, in Mill River, we don't have any hydro dams. Uh, so that's good, uh, at least better for, for the adults. Um, people have done very simple things to, to help eels get up over dams. Um, and this is one of them. It's what's called a low tech uh, or Delaware style eel pass where somebody simply draped a net over the dam and the eels find that rough uh, surface adequate to basically scoot up over that last six or eight inches of, of lip of the dam uh, to get over. Um, and it helps, it helps tremendously. Um, that's low cost, it's easy to implement, but it doesn't work everywhere, especially if you have a higher dam. In those cases, we usually uh, construct some sort of a um, upstream eel pass. Um, uh, these are usually ramps that have uh, flow coming down them. And we, we try to provide some attraction flow to get the eels to find them. Once they find them, they start climbing up um, and if you provide the right substrate, it's very easy for them to get from the bottom to the top. 
Um, the design of these things is, is pretty well worked out. Uh, there's a number of them built already. Um, an interesting one uh, has been recently constructed on the Millers River up in Orange at the New Home Dam. Um, and it's actually, instead of a, you know, a flight of stairs, if you will, it's actually a spiral stairway. <laughs> it has a spiral shape. Um, it has a very low footprint. And over on the right here, you can see it tucked nicely into the corner of the dam so it won't be damaged by debris or ice in the wintertime. Um, this was constructed by Lakeside Engineering in, in New Hampshire. Um, they've built a number of these now and they're actually working pretty well. This one's been in operation since 2019 and last year it passed 42 wheels. Um, this year it's doing as good or better than that in terms of eel passage. It doesn't sound like a lot of eels, but remember, you know, this is a site 20 kilometers upstream of the Miller's River um, and above Turner's Falls, which again is another dam, which pre prevents a lot of eels from getting even up to the Miller's. So we don't expect a lot of eels to pass here, um, but we're seeing numbers of them. And hopefully once Turner's Falls Dam gets better eel passage, we'll see a lot more. Um, for sea lamprey, things are a little bit more complicated. Um, we know they can't pass Lake Warner uh, Dam, um, but I'd like to know whether folks have seen them accumulating at the base of the dam. We, seem, uh, we see other species, like there's a sucker run that uh, they pile up below there. We know eels pile up below there, but I don't know if, if people have really seen lamprey piling up there. Um, and it's possible that there isn't a, a very strong run yet. <laughs> um, so, um, Typically, we need something like a fishway uh, or other uh, structure to, to pass uh, things like lamprey well. But I will say um, there's a, um, uh, an example on the Sawmill River in Montague at the book mill where the dam is basically blown out. And it's created a cascade there that isn't quite a waterfall, um, but it's, it's, it's certainly, you would think, how can any fish get up that? And lamprey do get up this. They get up and over it. Um, so uh, there's spawning that goes on upstream. So it's possible to, uh, to get uh, lamprey past uh, at least a, a cascade like this. Um, but doing things for sea lamprey is gonna be a little bit, a little bit tougher. Um, I will uh, uh, say though that opportunities for building fish passage structures uh, might be uh, uh, increasing with the new infrastructure bill. Um, the, the uh, helical eel pass at, at New Ho Dam was, was built with state money as part of dam rehabilitation. Uh, they needed to fix the dam and the dam owner said, can I put an eel pass in too? And the state said, sure. Um, so there are ways to get, to get funding for this uh, sort of stuff. Um, you just have to be uh, creative with it, <laughs> I think. Um, there are plenty of folks to talk to. Ken Sprankle will be talking tomorrow about some of the other diadromous species. Um, so, um, uh, definitely, if the group is interested in, in developing uh, passage for the uh, system, folks like Ken and others uh, can, can help them. Um, so with that, that's pretty much everything I have for today. Uh, if there's time, I'll take questions. Uh, otherwise, feel free to contact me um, uh, either through the chat or uh, send me an email. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Harrow. It's very interesting. Are there any questions? Matt? There's, there's, uh, I know eels aren't real popular as sports fish. I hear a lot of uh, fishermen disparaging them, even though they love them. They're the favorite bait for striped bass. But is there any, uh, is it, would there ever be a future in, in sport fishing for eel if their populations rebounded above a, whatever maximum uh, sustainable yield? Or yeah, well, there is, there's an active, uh, you can catch eels. It's legal to do so. Um, there's a size limit, I think, of they have to be at least six inches long. I don't think there's a bag limit. Um, what you catch them for, uh, maybe it's just recreation. Um, they are absolutely delicious if you know how to <laughs> prepare them correctly, uh, especially smoked. Um, and uh, few people know about that. You know, they, they look at eels, at, you know, kind of this slimy, disgusting, snake-like thing, and who would eat something like that? But uh, in colonial times, they were, they were a delicacy and they were very important to Native American peoples and they still are uh, as a food source and, and as a resource. So um, I don't think it's going to be as big a fishery as a shad fishery might be or Atlantic salmon fishery, which now we, we, we won't be having. 
Um, but uh, certainly there's, there's a great opportunity for having more eels in, in the Connecticut River system. Um, and if people target them, you know, for either consumption or recreation, um, they're there, they're available. Thank you. I think we need to move on. If anyone else has questions, could you please um, send them through the chat? Thank you very much, Dr. Harrow.